Well, hey, Crossover family. I just wanted to very briefly share an update with you. The California Department of Public Health announced that churches have permission now to be able to reopen statewide. However, there are certain guidelines that have been given, and if you have not already looked at them or checked in, in, into them, the, the guidelines are certainly very strict. But as a church, I really do think that it's important to take the recommendations that have been written very seriously. And after talking with some of the leadership, I think that it is certainly possible for us to work very hard at meeting much of these recommendations. Therefore, we plan on meeting as a church together for corporate worship in our sanctuary on June 7th. Now, I'm sure that you have some questions and uh, hopefully I have some answers, but let me just anticipate for a moment what some of those questions may be. You can certainly call me or text me or email me and I'll do my best to answer them, but let me just go through a few questions. Number one, how many services will there be? Well, we're going to have a service at 9.30 and a service at 11. But we're also going to have a pre-recorded service for those that are not able to come and to worship corporately quite yet uh, because they're trying to be cautious or whatever the reason may be. And that recorded sermon will be uploaded late every Saturday night, and you can watch it anytime on Sunday morning. So technically, every single weekend, you'll have options for three services. Two on Sunday in our sanctuary, and one on Sunday online. So it'll be the same sermon series, the same sermon. The only difference, though, is that there won't be any music on our online service. So it's just going to be the sermon. Uh, the second question to answer would be this. What efforts have we put forth in order to be able to worship in a healthy environment? Well, obviously, as we stated, we're going to do our best to follow the recommendations that have been given in the guidelines. For example, we've set the chairs up in the sanctuary in such a way that it promotes social distancing. Uh, families are going to be able to sit together, but um, there's going to be lots of space. So there's going to be space as a family to the side of you, space in front of you, and space behind you. The sanctuary has also been deep cleaned. We're also going to have volunteers come and clean between services. And if you'd like to be one of those volunteers, I would love for you to be one of those volunteers. Please contact Heidi Palmer, and she'll get you connected with Mike Perryman, our facilities employee, and they will gladly put you on the schedule. We also have automatic hand sanitizing dispensers that are going to be available for you. So think about that. You don't even have to push it down on anything. These are going to be automatic. There's going to be one in the sanctuary, I think, and one in the lobby. The Tuesday after service, the sanctuary is going to be cleaned. And the goal is that nobody steps foot in that thing again until the next Sunday. So lots of time for the virus to die out is going to happen, I think, um, if the virus was at all present that previous Sunday. We're not going to be passing the offering plate. There's going to be a designated box in the back for you to safely drop your offering and your attendance cards in. We're going to be providing masks. We're going to be providing gloves. Now, if you could, I am going to ask you, please, 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 to take your temperature on Sunday morning before you leave home. If you have a temperature, please stay home. If you don't have a temp, please come. Now, if you get to the church, silly you, and you realize, hey, I forgot to take my temperature, fear not, only believe, because we're going to have a temperature device here for you that you can use, and it's a fantastic one. We don't even have to touch with you with it. It's like a little radar gun, supposedly. Um, so that'll work. There's also going to be lots of signage with valuable information on how to avoid COVID-19. But there's all kinds of things that we're doing, and those are some of them. But the last question, or actually the second last question, uh, what about my kids? Is there going to be daycare? Is there going to be children's church? Uh, sadly, there's not going to be any daycare or children's church. As you know, it's uh, almost impossible for babies and kids to be social distancing. And the desire of the government is that children are to remain with their family unit the entire time. 
Now, being a parent of a three-year-old and a one-year-old, I can understand some of the difficulties here, how it may affect parents of young children. Uh, my wife is thinking through what she might do because I know my son, Tobias, is just going to be in his own little world, running everywhere and, and crying out, probably causing her and everyone else around her to be distracted. So I get it. And I would say just three things about that. First, I can preach through anything. So if your baby cries my entire sermon, don't worry, I'll make it through. You know, don't feel as though you, you can't come because your kids are just going to end up being a distraction. We're a church family and we can figure it out. It's just for a season. Secondly, I would say that we, we do have a cry room available. And since we're doing two services, I don't anticipate that it's going to be very full. Um, there's even room in there for the babies and toddlers to crawl around. Uh, you may want to bring toys, though, because we won't have any toys available. We also have headsets that parents can wear, and if you feel more comfortable in the lobby or even just outside the sanctuary, you can listen in on the service in that way. Now, for the parents that are watching the kids in service, I understand that you might not be able to focus as much as you would like. And that's one of the mo most concerning things here for you is that you're coming and you're not going to be able to truly study the word and, um, you know, because of some of the distractions. And to that, I'll say this. This is one of the areas of the COVID-19 guidance document that we're going to keep thinking through. If we need to think through adjustments in this area, I promise we will. I don't want our parents of young children to be able or to, to feel left out. So don't shy about sending me your thoughts concerning this. We can think through this together as a church. And the last question would be this. What if I think that these guidelines aren't reasonable? Can we just forget about them? Well, because the guidelines use phrases such as you should do this instead of you must do this, we're tempted to say that we have... Uh, free reign to not listen to the recommendations and I certainly get that but instead of saying we don't like these guidelines and therefore we aren't going to follow them perhaps we might pause and reflect for a moment and ask God for patience and for wisdom as James 1 says I'm not going to sit there and force you to wear a mask I'm not going to sit there and force you to wear gloves you know, in fact, you may have medical reasons not to wear a mask, and I understand that. The doctors, even, the doctor whom you trust is saying different things than the doctors that you're hearing on the news whom you don't trust. So I get it. Uh, you may even detect political motives, and you may think that at least some of these guidelines have been shaped by politics. And, of course, you have the right to believe that, and and maybe there is some truth to it. I'm not here to debate whether the guidelines are politically motivated or not. My only hope is that all of us would strive for a godly attitude. An attitude that says, let's do what we can for the sake of the vulnerable, for the sake of the church, and for the sake of the people who are lost in our community. I heard a story about a large family that was sitting down for breakfast and the father gave thanks for the food, as he always did. But immediately after that he gave thanks, he had a habit of beginning to grumble about hard times and the poor quality of the food that he was forced to eat. And that's exactly what he did. He grumbled about it after giving thanks, how the food was cooked and all these different things. And his little daughter interrupted him and said, Dad, do you suppose that God heard what you had said a while ago when you were giving thanks? And the father confidently replied, well, yes. But dad, did he also hear your complaints over the bacon and the coffee as well? And with a cautious tone in his voice, he said, yes. And then his daughter asked, well, what do you think God found to be more truthful? Your giving of thanks or your complaints about what he has given? And the father didn't answer. You know, the temptation is to give thanks to God and say, well, great, we can finally open. Thank you, God, so much for your provision. But there's also the temptation there where we walk into the sanctuary and we grumble and complain about the way things are. And I just ask, uh, you know, will God find 
your thankfulness to be more truthful or will he find your complaints to be more truthful? Now my hope, because attitude is everything, that uh, we would be able to have an attitude that is shaped by uh, a godly spirit. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to looking or to seeing you this uh, June 7th, Sunday for worship. And uh, I, in no way, um, I in no way am looking down on anybody that is not coming. Of course, if you're not coming for medical reasons or you come because there's a principle that you're standing by, whatever it may be, I, uh, I encourage you to follow the Lord's leading in this. And thank you so much. And I can't wait to meet with all of you again. God bless.